Yo, yo, yo. What's up, y'all? Appreciate everybody tuning in. Thank you. You are now vibing with us for the episode five of Studio Talk. We here with the legendary DJ Newmark. What's up, man? Hey, what's good? Hey, I appreciate you having me on your platform, man. I've seen some of your episodes. You're doing the biggest, and the culture definitely needs you. So much respect to you and your platform. Thanks, fam. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this. You, like guys like you, you pretty much laid the blueprint for us to, you know, try and do our thing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you as like somebody that, like a pioneer. So I look up to you. You feel me? Appreciate that. As like, you know, the OG legends. You feel me? But yeah, man. I once again thank you for coming here. We're gonna have a good episode. We're gonna get in depth of everything, like your life, your journey, through DJing. Um, everything that you experience up to this point and what you want to do in the future. Fantastic, let's do it. Fire. All right, let's start, um, let's start about like when you grew up as a child, where you're from, your background, and um, you know, your, your, your family tree. Okay, well, my background's a little um, diverse. I, when people always ask me where I'm from, it's hard to say because my father was in the military. And so I'm half black and half Korean, but yet I was born in Japan um, because after my mother and father met, the next duty station was in Japan. So literally every three years of my life, from birth all the way to adulthood, up, to, up until 2012 actually, I literally moved around three to four years of my life. And so, um, growing up as a military, military dependent, not staying in one area, I was very cultured, you know, from places in the Far East to probably about 30 out of the 50 states um, that I lived in. Uh, my father retired from the Air Force um, in 90, and that last duty station was in California. So I graduated high school in California and thus, you know, entered the, the real world, you know. So I don't, I claim California only because my social security number associates California um, because we were overseas uh, in, in, in Asia. So all of the, the social security numbers of the Americans born on foils, foreign lands took California's uh, numerage for the social security number. Um, but then after graduating high school, I in turn joined the military and continued moving uh, all the way up until 2012, basically, when I uh, landed in Florida. So, um, you know, it's kind of hard to, to really answer when people ask me where, I'm, where am I from because, you know, and that's a whole nother discussion. Where you're born, in my humble opinion, doesn't mean where you're from. The way I look at where you're from is what, where were you at that influenced how you thought, how, how, how you, where you got your personality from, you know, the environment in which you came up, what influenced you? I look at that as the answer to where somebody would say where you're from. Because I, I can tell you I know people that might have been born in New York, but then moved to Arizona. And if somebody says, where are you from? And now they're adult. You say New York. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, what part? You know, Brooklyn, what? And they're like, well, I, I, I moved when I was a baby. You can't say you're from New York then. You know, I hope that's making any sense. So Yeah, that makes sense. So that, that's pretty much my background, moving around, man. And, and I think uh, when it came to me DJing, what aided in the success is that I had a lot of different sounds. You know, everywhere that I lived, as hip hop in the early 80s was starting to saturate uh, those areas, it, it, every, every region had its own sound, right? Music is that way, especially in hip hop. But the beautiful thing about that is when I was coming up and my father was in the Air Force, on those Air Force bases, we would have what? People from all over the world, people from all over the country. So in one area, I would have music through a, a service member from New York. I would have music 
from somebody from Cali, from Florida, from the Midwest. You know, I was just maybe a little late in getting some of that music. But I think uh, as my DJ journey um, matured, that helped me uh, play to a more variety of, of crowds because um, I, I wasn't stuck with one regional sound as a DJ. You know what I'm saying? I was able to, to go through so many different complexities of music and everyone would, you, you, you didn't have a, a choice but to appreciate it because maybe you wasn't feeling one type of song because I was playing a West Coast song and you was from New York. Well, within, you know, two or three minutes, I'm slapping on something else and, and now, now I got you. Just when I was losing you, now you're right back. And so it was that way for a lot of different crowds, man. Um, so I think my background and my diversity of being all over the world definitely played a part in, in me being um, the successful DJ that I am today. How did you uh, get into DJing? You know, it's a funny story because, you know, when, when hip hop, from when I first remember being introduced to it uh, around 84, 1985, um, you know, obviously we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have videos and stuff. So I, I couldn't, I didn't know exactly what a DJ was doing. Um, so obviously I, I, I tried to rap, you know, and that I found out kind of quickly that I couldn't freestyle. And no matter where I was at, different talent shows, everybody was freestyle rapping and doing all of the dissing and making everybody laugh and ooh and and so I said, well, I, I can't freestyle, so I got to figure out something else with the culture because I was feeling it. Like all the youngsters back then, I was 13, 14, I'm feeling the culture, the, 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 the music was hitting me different, but yet being that my father, you know, from the South, uh, from Mississippi, he always had music in the house. A lot of that earlier music was, was using some of the disco era, the, the, the 70s music, yeah. so I wasn't quite new, you know, I, I heard many of those samples and bass lines, so it, it just automatically drew me to it. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I can't rap, so I'm going to dance. You know, I could always dance back in the day. I was Michael Jackson down. I'd do my little twist kick, you know, and my little, you know, pelvic thrust and all that. So then when, when hip hop came through, I said, all right, well, you know, I can, I can pop. And, and I could backspin, and I could do some of the basic stuff. So I started doing that. And then uh, in the areas, uh, on the Air Force bases that I was growing up, they would always have these contests, break dancing contests and stuff. And I was pretty good. I was winning, um, or, or at least placing. And uh, I was getting notoriety among my high schools and, and, and local high schools and things. And, but... Um, when the rappers would ask if I would dance for them on certain competitions and stuff, I kind of felt, even though I did it, I kind of saw how the rappers were getting more of the attention. Like I was in the background, back, 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 background. And I felt like I had more to offer to hip hop. You know, I loved it so much that I felt that I could give back more. So I started thinking about it again, like, man, what, what else can I do in the culture? Now, by this time, even though through the music I could hear DJs scratching and stuff, we didn't know exactly what they were doing. I mean, I, I did everything from taking literally a record and getting a, a penny and <laughs> literally scratching. Okay, They say, hey, the DJ's scratching, so okay. I literally would take that coin and scratch the record. And it kind of emulated the sounds, right, that I was hearing. But I was like, man, this, I'm messing up a lot of these records <laughs> doing that. So then um, somebody told me, well, you know what? They're not really, they're not really scratching with a, a turntable. They're actually taking a zipper and going up and down on the zipper. And so I would try that, and that sounded like, you know, scratching too. But how can I do that performing wise. I was like, nah, that ain't right. So finally, Herbie Hancock's video came out, Rocket. And even though we didn't see um, a DJ on there, 
the, he did show a turntable and it kind of helped me understand that, all right, so there's something to this turntable. Now, my dad had a turntable and behind his back, obviously, I'm manipulating the turntable, but it's not, I'm not making the jigga jigga, you know? So I'm like, what, where's the missing piece? So thank God, um, um, I forgot what video it was where I actually saw Grandmaster Flash. Now, mind you, I'm not in New York, so I'm behind. Um, I think, actually, I think we were in the Philippines at that time. And I saw Grandmaster Flash uh, talk about two things. He talked about there was a material underneath the, the, the record um, that, that would allow the, the record to be able to move back and forth while the platter is still spinning. Because without that, and you would try to manipulate it, you would literally stop the platter. So when you would let it go, the music would, you know, and so that, that didn't work. So when, uh, shout out to Grandmaster Flash, by the way. When I saw that and saw that he was the one to make the first mixer, um, it was over from that point. And, you know, to be a DJ, there weren't that many because why? If you rap, that was free. If you danced, if you was a b-boy, that was free to do too. The only investment you had was maybe buying cardboard. So to be a DJ, that was a very, very low ratio because it took money to get the equipment. And I said, all right, well, being that my dad's in the military, you know, there's this perception that military brats get spoiled because they, and to a degree, you know, we were, we were middle income. So I was able to, uh, convince my dad in getting me some e equipment. Um, and the first uh, professional, in my eyes, equipment were a pair of Newmark turntables. And I tore them things up. I mean, t those things, they went through hell and back. But I always said that if I got successful and I was able to contribute to the culture, I would never forget those Newmark turntables. So hence the name DJ Newmark came about with a slight twist because the Newmark brand is N-U-M-A-R-K. And I said, okay, I, I want to be different but still pay my homage. So N-E-W-M-A-R-K is what I came up with. And um, now my popularity, I thought I was very popular as a dancer as a DJ, I went through the roof because not too many DJs. And so um, now as I moved, um, which I guess would be one of the bad things about being military because I couldn't really um, implant you know, myself in a particular community because right when I'm getting comfortable, we're moving again. Um, but the beauty in that was um, I got to kind of reinvent myself as a DJ. You know, one, one place might have known me as a certain kind of DJ. But then when I moved to another place and started saturating my, my skill set in the community that we lived in, I could be a different kind of DJ. I could be a DJ that I wish I could have been in the last you know what I'm saying? So I was always reinventing myself. Of course, it didn't take much time for me to get popular in those areas because everybody was like, yo, you're a DJ, man. We need a DJ. We're putting together a group. Everyone's putting together groups, you know? And so that's pretty much, you know, how DJ Newmark um, came about. And it, it also gives a little bit of um, insight on the dynamic range of musical influences that I had, um, again, compared to being in one particular region all my life. You know, nothing, nothing against those people who stayed in New York or stayed in Cali or stayed in whatever, um, but those people tend to be a little um, biased, I guess you can say, um, that everyone thinks that their 
region of musical influence to hip hop is is the number one contribution, you know? And I don't have that. I don't have that bias at all. I, I take hip hop in all forms. Even people, it's, it's crazy how music is, especially hip hop. There are people overseas that can't even speak the English language, but tell them that they're not in the hip hop culture and they're ready to fight you, you know? So I've seen, and, and I've been a part of the, the evolution of hip hop from a global standpoint. Um, that I'm, I'm very proud of and, and I relish to this day. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how music has changed like with hip hop these days, like going further, because I don't think hip hop is that old. You said um, you, you were DJing in 84. You started pretty I much. I started in 84. And that's yeah. like when hip hop pretty much started around that time with, with the DJs. Well, technically in New York, nah. In okay. New York, it started in the late 70s. But, okay. but, but for it to leave uh, the Bronx, right, and to migrate throughout the United States and then overseas, it was about 84 to when I first was introduced to hip hop. That's, that's amazing. That's like before the internet, before everything. <laughs> <laughs> like it's Cell crazy. Phones. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how you were telling me you were trying to figure out how to, how to, de like to get that sound and like, you didn't know how to get that sound until you saw uh, Grandmaster Flash do it. Right, right. While those people in New York, they already knew. Yeah. So. That's crazy. How, how, how did you feel like traveling so much and, you know, soaking up all those different cultures of life? And I liked it. The only big drawback is that, you know, a lot of communities, especially in hip hop, um, it was hard to integrate myself and to be accepted because, again, you have kids or, or should I say people who grew up with each other. And if you always knew this individual as a DJ or you knew this individual as a rapper, now here comes some kid that, you know, you know is not from that area. And yet they're trying to integrate themselves. And it was... It was just hard. You know, I'm not going to say it was, it was, there was amount of prejudice. I'm not going to say that. But again, um, much like sports, you know, if you go to a new park to play basketball, no one knows you. And you could be waiting for a long time to get your first game. Because why? Everybody that's accustomed to going to that particular location, they know each other. So they're always going to pick the face and the person that they know, you know, to play basketball. And so in the music industry, as I was trying to find different locations to DJ, it was really, 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 really hard because they're like, you know, why you? And, and I already got these DJs or, or you know, again, back then we didn't, we didn't have the, the conveniences of the Internet and social media and all that, so... I literally was going door to door like I was selling vacuum cleaners or Tupperware, you know, and, and asking these people that were entertainers, hey, do you need a DJ? You know, uh, can I, can I, you know, like roller skating rinks. Okay. Roller skating rinks was like, I mean, because again, we're, we're adolescents, can't go to the club. So uh, roller skating rinks was the only place that I knew where they would play hip hop and a percentage of the people that would go, I don't, I don't know if it's like that today, but I would say it was like a 60-40 split of non-skaters going to the skating rink as kids so we could actually stand in the middle of, this, of the skating rink and dance. Like, that was our club. We would dance in the skating rink while people would, that came to skate, skate around us. So it was really hard, really, 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 really hard. And... Um, the only places that I was able to um, have a sure bet that they would let me DJ is with the schools that I was attending. You know, um, we would have these, I remember, <laughs> I remember like in ninth grade where we're, we're, we're hip hop and they would have these older DJs that was playing like Donna Summer or, or the Bee Gees, you know, and, 
and and I remember the the um, the administrators, you know, really trying to figure out how can we get more kids to support these school dances. And so I would tell them, hey, look, you know, I'm a DJ. You're trying to bring youth here. Well, I'm a youth. I know what we listen to. You know, let me let me just do one and let's see how it goes. And often I would say, like, you don't have to have to pay me, you know, because, again, I'm not a professional. I'm a high school kid. And they would say, okay, you know, and they would watch me with a real, you know, fine tooth, make sure, you know, I wouldn't do anything inappropriate, what have you. Um, and then, you know, very short, shortly, I would increase the participation because now the word was getting out. And then, and then kids from other schools were coming to support because, again, we were playing or I was playing the music that we listened to, you know. But outside of that, where there were other DJs, it was hard. It, it really, it really was hard to to get a piece of that because people w was very close knit. You know, the music industry to this day is still very close knit. It's hard. Well, it's easier now because now you don't need A and Rs. You don't need record labels. You don't need. You know, if if you have your own computer and you got Spotify, Apple Play, or all this other stuff, you can upload your own music and pretty much distribute your own stuff. And you know, it's totally different now, but. So those, I would say that would be the negative, always trying to um, introduce and integrate into new communities. Like during high school, you were like pretty much beginning your DJ career, like professionally, like wanting to do it seriously. Yes, yes. And, and not afraid to have people listen to me. Yeah. You know, because you could be in the bedroom all day long. You thinking you jam Master J or somebody and, you know, kind of like singing, right? You know, you could, you could sing in your shower all day long or sing whatever, but it's different when you know you have people listening and people actually judging you, you know, while they're listening. You know, are you, can you sing, you know, or, or can you actually DJ? Because, again, the, the, the DJing, change from disc jockeys. You know, from the 70s and 80s, you had disc jockeys. Song on, song off. New song on, new song off. And maybe some, you know, slight talking. Yeah, that was, you know, Ray Parker Jr. with Ghostbusters. And, you know, so now hip hop, DJing really didn't do a lot of talking initially because we talked with our hands. So now the kids want to hear like, all right, can you scratch? Can you blend? Can you mix? How is your transitions? You know, and then by that time, um, when, when I'm in high school, like in 10th grade, now we had Yo! MTV raps. And now globally people were seeing what DJs were doing. Shout out to DJ Scribble. Um, you know, these were the kind of people that was now um, highly visible to show people what DJing is all about. Now, I must admit, you know, there are different kind of DJs out there. You got your real trick DJs, uh, people who can, you know, scratch with your, their mouth and, and with their back and they're turning and twisting and turling. Uh, shout out to my man, DJ Lord Jazz of the Lords of the Underground. He is uh, somebody that I, to this day, I look as a big brother. He's very inspirational because he does those type of tricks. Uh, and then you have um, more of a party DJ, like DJ Kid Capri. Shout out to you, Kid. I kind of put myself more aligned with that, even though Kid can't scratch. He can do all those things. But more so, he's a, a party rocker. You know, he's more of an environmentalist, should I say. Uh, not that uh, Lord Jazz can't, but... It's, it's kind of hard to dance when your DJ is going back and forth, back and forth, scratch, 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 back and forth, back and forth. You know, it, not to say that that, that that type of DJ is bad, by no means, because that's hip hop, right? But I'm more the kind of, look, I want you out of your seat. I want you to have a good time. We're going to dance, and next thing you know, you sweating, and, and you can't believe that you've been on the floor for 45 minutes. That's, I, I, wanna, I want you to escape into the music. Uh, so I perform that way. Um, and um, 
Damn, I forgot why I got that. What, what you said that made me go there, but um, we was talking about like, like during high school when you was like first getting like serious with DJ. Ah, oh, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. What's yeah. that moment like when you like first was like taking it serious and like you had to really perform like and show people like what you got and and you wanted to be respected and, and liked and all that like. What, what moment was that? Like? Well, I mean, from the very first time, man, that I, I did a school dance, you know, you had at least 150 kids. And you know, kids are brutal when it comes to being honest. And they would have booed me right up out of there. And the administration would have taken note and they would have never allowed me to continue. So... That right there was was the test. That first time that I performed, never forget it. I can tell you that I've forgotten a lot of other performances and a lot of other gigs and things that I've done, concerts. But that one, um, basically, you could say I, I lost my DJ virginity. And, uh, and it was good. And, and, and hip-hop uh, loved me and, and publicly. You know, I wasn't just a side chick. Uh, hip hop uh, embraced me in, in front of the world that night, and and I've never turned uh, turned my back on hip hop. After um, the dances and all the uh, different things you were doing, like what was the next like stage in your DJ career like that really like wanted you to push and go harder with with okay. your dreams and everything? So now I'm not a kid. I graduated high school, and like I said before, I interned during the military, and now I'm continuing to travel. Now I'm traveling as an adult, so now I get to go into clubs, and now I get to go into, you know, I can make a bigger impact because I'm an adult now. Um, I, my, my big break, I guess you can say, was um, 2010. Now, mind you, from... 1990 when I joined the military to 2010, I'm DJing, but I'm DJing at clubs, okay? So I'm now professionally getting paid for my DJ contributions, right? Um, but of course, it was on a part-time basis because the military was my primary obligation. Um, but before I get into my discovery, that was actually one of the things that uh, I was able to um, take advantage of because, you know, when you, when you think about music, you think about entertainers, there's that negative cliche, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then when you talk about hip hop, there's always this, this um, perception that, oh, uh, you know, the, the, the entertainers are going to be late. The entertainers uh, are going to be... Um, um, uh, 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 you know, our urban communities don't have the best representation, right? And so since hip hop is the music of the urban community, um, not anymore, it's, it's, it's international now, but back then, they always expected uh, for, their, for the DJ or whoever to be late or, 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 or high or drunk or, or something, something other than professional. And so part of my, um, my business model was to always talk about, hey, look, I'm drug free because why? I'm in the military full time. You know, I, I don't drink. I'm very punctual. Um, you know, how, how can I not be and be in the military? So I would present that first to different club owners and, and to different um, concert promoters or, or what, whatever I was trying to get into to get their attention and then let my DJing take over. So I was able to give them something that they didn't commonly get approached with, right? Uh, so I'm building my DJ resume, DJing at the hottest spots in the different areas and the communities that I was living in as I moved around the world and around the country. Uh, till 2010, I'm at um, Fort, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and they had a club there on the base, and I was DJing there on a Saturday night. And this was a time when 
um, Russell Simmons was, um, he had just um, uh, signed a, 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 a partnership with the military to have his clothes, his clothing line, Fat Farm, sold exclusively on the base. And so uh, um, he came and um, you know, I met him. And that night in the club, some of his uh, entourage actually came through where I was at and they liked what they heard. And they knew from, from earlier when, during the meet and greet that I was in the military and stuff. And so uh, we exchanged numbers and they're like, you know, you know, how would you like to, um, you know, potentially work with Russell Simmons one day? I was like, of course, sure. why, you know, why not? And so Fort Dix, New Jersey was like two hours away from New York. So certainly within driving distance for me to shoot up there. Well, a year passed and I hadn't heard from them. And I'm like, and again, I, we didn't have the kind of resources as we do today. And to, even in 2010, it was all about my space, you know, so... Um, yeah, I was like, okay, the one thing we know about entertainment, there's a lot of false promises. You know, maybe people might have had good intentions. You know, you always run into somebody, yeah, man, I'm working, I'm in the studio. You know, I'm, I'm going to be dropping an album. You know, everyone was always kind of talking that way. And promoters were always talking that way to me. Hey, well, I'm putting together this big old showcase. I want you to be a part of it, you know, and it just fizzles out for whatever reason. So I thought, okay, this is another situation. Well, one day I did get called up, um, not by him, but by someone in his camp. And uh, I was presented with an opportunity to, to DJ in New York. And I did it. And I think what really, another thing that separated me um, was that being that DJing was basically a side hustle because, again, my primary responsibility was to the military. <clears throat> I wasn't paper chasing necessarily, you know? And when they was like, okay, well, you know, how much is this going to cost us? I told them, nothing. And they couldn't believe it. They was like, wait a minute, you're going to DJ this event that's associated with a, with a celebrity, uh, one of the godfathers, you were talking about godfather, godfather of the culture, Mr. Russell Simmons, you're not going to take any money? I'm like, no. They was like... You are a guy for real. And so I did it, man. And, and, and much like that very first experience in performing publicly in, pr in front of my peers at the high school, I didn't know who was going to be in that crowd. So I wanted to make sure that I was on, on my game. And, and I did what I did. And um, I never did anything else in conjunction with, with them in New York. But the amount of networking um, uh, opportunities that came from that, which was the main goal. Uh, it wasn't about the money. It was about the networking. Um, it winded up last year. I still have those connections to this day in, in, in 2022, um, which when I moved from New Jersey to California, where my parents still reside, I, I was stationed in the Bay Area. And I've always been an Oakland Raider fan. Always been. It was something about their mystique, you know, and, and, and the grit and grind that that organization had. And of course, the Super Bowl wins and the Bo Jacksons. And, you know, they always had world-class athletes, you know. And um, one of the contacts that I had met on the East Coast had told me, now this is in 2015, um, that, that they were looking for a DJ. Now, the Oakland Raiders is pretty interesting because they actually have three DJs. They have one DJ who is inside the Oakland Coliseum, or they had because they're in Las Vegas now. But, and then they would have another DJ in a VIP section where some of the, um, like in the booths, you know, where the high profile people would be. And then they would have another DJ in the parking lot for the tailgaters. You know, and the Oakland Raiders was notorious for having some of the best tailgating environments where fans wouldn't even buy a ticket to get in the stadium. They just paid for parking and they would barbecue and have their portable TVs out. You know, it's like, 
So, so the Raiders would have someone out there, and we would kind of rotate. Um, and so I had an opportunity to, to be a part of that. I tried out. Uh, I, I auditioned, pitched to them the same thing that I always been pitching, um, you know. And and now I'm at I'm towards the end of my career, so I'm like, look, I'm a senior ranking person in the military. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm always gonna be professional. I'm gonna uphold um, the 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 image of the organization. You know, not gonna have to worry about me being um, on a tabloid on, on, in, a, in a club doing something, you know, because I just wasn't that, you know, I wasn't built that way. So I got that opportunity and DJ uh, with them from 2015 to 2017. Um, I only got to be inside the Coliseum once, um, but I didn't care. As long as I'm performing in front of Raider Nation, you know, hey, you know, so... So I, I always try to clarify, I wasn't like the um, official Oakland Raiders DJ, but I was a part of the official you know, Oakland Raiders DJ camp, you know. Um, and then from that, I had um, somebody else told me, you know, hey, this particular uh, Grammy group was looking. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow, I forgot a big thing. Okay, let me go back to, let me go back to 2008. 2008, so this was before Russ, 2008, um, I was stationed in, in Kentucky, and I was an avid motorcyclist, and I had um, a, a Suzuki Hayabusa, which was, at the time, the world's fastest production uh, motorcycle, and uh, I had joined the Rough Riders, and I didn't know that the record label, Rough Riders, had different divisions within, within, their, within their namesake. They had the entertainment, DMX and all them. Then they had the dog division, where you would always see the dogs and stuff in, in the videos. So if you had a pit bull, um, and, and, and it had to be a, like an expensive pit bull or whatever, you could be a part of that. And then they had the motorcycle and car division. So being that, um, you know, I had one of the fastest bikes, you know, they, they approached me, and, and so I wind up being a part of Rough Riders. And then, it, and then it, it didn't take them long for me to, or it didn't take me long to let them know that, hey, look, I, I dibble in, in music too. You know, I'm a DJ. So when we would have Rough Rider chapter events, I'm DJing it. And DMX and some of the people, uh, uh, Eve and, and Jadakiss, they would travel around to support these different functions because it was still Rough Rider. And one particular time, DMX was where I was at, and I'm DJing, and he came up to me kind of like how you and I are talking I couldn't believe that this was a multi-platinum actor, uh, I mean, recording artist slash actor, just talking to me without the hype and the Hollywood. And, and so, you know, I, I was given an opportunity by him to um, perform with him, you know, as a backup, because his primary DJ, for whatever reason, wasn't available. Um, and so I did that show with him and I actually got to hang out with him throughout that whole time that he was there. Um, on my Instagram, you'll see videos of us. Um, but, and so he, he schooled me a lot of the entertainment side of the house. So now that's on my resume. Fast forward to 2010. Yeah, I, I see how everything lines up. Right, right. So now going back to Oakland, um, uh, one of the one of the Raider players was dating um, a member of of a five time um, Grammy award winning group, and they were looking for a DJ. And so I took that opportunity, um, and I and I I went through the the standard protocol of, of auditioning and all that. But pretty much, I had I had the inside track on that. 
and I was able to, able to perform with them for a couple of shows. And the experience that I got from that was completely 180 from the experience I got with, with, with being with DMX. Uh, rest in peace to DMX and rest in peace to Lisa Left Eye Lopez. But, you know, but it, but it also cultivated um, uh, the, the, the industry. It looked, I'm doing the same job, but it looked and felt completely different between DMX and, and the other group, you know. So, um, and again, throughout those situations, I increased my network. And uh, I was on my way to doing big things uh, once I retired from the military. But COVID stopped a lot of that. I, I was talking with Montel Jordan. I was talking uh, to Redman. And all of these um, situations were, were going in the right direction with me possibly linking up. But then COVID hit, the world stopped. You know, the world stopped. And so did all my dreams of doing the things that I was trying, that I was working really hard to set up. Because now I didn't have any more military obligation, you know, so I could truly go wherever, whenever, you know, I wanted to without having any, any uh, restraints, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's how I got to the radio because no one's touring, the world shut down, everyone's stuck in their homes. Um, and all I had to do was, and, and let me just say this too, being that I'm old school, I, I'm kind of behind in a lot of different um, um, topics of life. Um, for example, social media. I really didn't have a need to be really involved on social media until I found out how social media was important during the lockdowns. Because when you're performing in front of an audience, as a performer, as an entertainer, I feed off the energy from the crowd. And you automatically get feedback, whether you're doing something good or you're doing something bad. The crowd gives you feedback, so you can adjust on the fly right then and there uh, when you're doing live performing. In Radio Land, you have no clue if you are pleasing your listeners or if you are annoying your listeners. And that's something that I had to get over internally because uh, during my mixing, and, and you know, I, I did a lot of second guessing early in, in my in my journey on radio. Uh, you know, do I let this song play, uh, you know, a little longer, or or because if I personally like the song, then of course I'm gonna have a little bias. But that doesn't mean my listeners are gonna share that same bias towards that song. So I tell you, it was, it was very, 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 very interesting. And uh, I think, you know, over a year later, um, the feedback that I got from my listeners um, has been very positive. Uh, matter of fact, the only criticism that I got was sometimes I would transition out of a song too fast. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it was hard for, it's hard for me to gauge that because just when, you know, when I think you might be enjoying the music, in reality, you might be changing the channel. Uh, and so I try to explain that to our listeners that I'd rather uh, uh, transition out of a song prematurely, because at least I know you heard the whole song, versus me leaving it, and now the listener that didn't like that song left before the end of the song. Mm -hmm. So I think our listeners pretty much understand that. Um, which I never did until getting into the industry. But I tell you, it's probably the best thing that I've ever done. I, I've had a lot of great performances and a lot of great opportunities, but um, being on the radio and knowing that I have listeners literally, like they say in England, literally, literally across the globe listening to me live, I... I've never had that kind of platform. And, you know, my social media has grown exponentially since being on the radio because now I have people that are not just where I'm at following me. I have people across the globe. It's awesome. It's, it's, been, it's been really, 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 really cool. And I'm glad that um, I'm on the radio, definitely. 
Yeah, that's amazing. We got to figure out how to how to get more of the uh, that technology the live streaming too. That's gonna help everything go up, uh, like a whole nother audience, like in the internet. Absolutely, like your platform. Yeah. You know, I saw on one of your episodes you had like two thousand people that had viewed uh, one of your episodes, and I'm like, that's that's beautiful, you know, because now. You don't even know where those 2,000 people were. It could be people in Japan. It could be wherever. Yeah, that's how powerful the internet is. Like, I, I get people all over the world. Um, Nigeria hit, hit me up. Um, England. Um, a lot Brazil. Uh, a lot of places in the United States. That's right. That's right. And, and justifiable. Your platform is awesome. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm just trying to uh, build content and educate and just give information. You know, like everything that you were saying about um your journey and and how you evolved up to this point. I feel like it's vital for anybody to on their journey also because it can help them aspire to be something in a situation that you've been through they might go through the same situation and, like, view it a whole different way because what what you told them, you know? You know, I think that's a, a great point you bring up. Um, often I'm asked what advice would I give um, somebody up and coming uh, in today's challenges and in, in today's world. The only thing that, that I can say is, you know, if it's your dream, then you write the narrative of how it plays out. You know, don't let someone, um, whether it's me or or a family member or a close friend, try to take you off of your vision. Now, it's okay not, you know, don't go through your journey with blinders because now you may miss certain things that you should have seen that maybe somebody is trying to help you see. But at the same time, it's your vision. It's your dream. You can change it as need be on the fly. I think, you know, in today's world, your dreams can be realized even easier than what could have ever been done. Because again, uh, in music, you had to literally sell hundreds of copies out of your trunk uh, of whatever you were trying to do to, to, to gain your, your, your audience, you know? Where now, you don't have to do that. Click here, click there. Uh, uh, distro kid here, distro kid there. Like, you know, you, 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 can, you can literally go from point A to Z from the comfort of your home with technology, having the right equipment, and you can be the next internet sensation. Yeah, technology is... is um it's it's crazy right now. Like, I feel like it's gonna get even crazier, and like you have to understand a certain way of um, just moving in this this technology world because it's not like the old days. Like no more. It's not like everything's intertwined with technology, social media, and um, yeah. It's, it's that's one of the things that I really appreciate um, your platform here because we are. Actually, in a studio. Yeah, I don't know if your viewers know, but this is this is a real background. This is not yeah. that 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 right. digital, you know, uh, stuff that they do where you sitting somewhere in your living room, but you never know they're in their living room because of the backdrop. Yeah, you know. And so, your viewers, I just want all y'all to know out there, this is authentic. That's why Newmark is here because he's old school, and I'm all down for that old school feel. It's a real couch and everything. <laughs> <laughs> the couch you sink into. <laughs> That's fine. I got a question for you, fam. Um, with you being in radio, I I know a lot of um, like younger uh, generation. They don't even consider the radio at all. And like the um, the like the pretty much the age range of people listening to the radio is is not really like. It's it's more the older crowd with the music and everything. And um I wanna know what you feel about changing that, like bringing um just more like excitement with radio, 
with the youth because in my personal opinion, I feel like it's gonna die if if it doesn't incorporate some type of um, way to bring the younger crowd in. You know, that's um that's a Pandora's box right there because before all of the techno technological advances, you needed the radio to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so the game was, all right, let me go up to a radio station with my demo. Let me, you know, find out who the program director is. Let me find out who the A&R people are. Let me see if I can't try to impress them so that they can now play my radio I'll play my music on the radio and remember the number one goal of being on the radio is to get to the masses well why I think I kind of agree with you to a certain extent that today's music doesn't depend upon the radio because people can take that they can take their own music and put it out somewhere where the masses are already there. And then the listener knows that they don't have to go to the radio to hear their favorite music because they can go to whatever platform that's streaming their, the music that they want to hear. So the whole music industry's cut the radio out. And, and I'm inclined to agree with you that I believe like in some cars, they don't even have CD players in them no more, right? Some car, some of the newer cars, just have radio. And I and I strongly believe that the way that the trend is going, that only the the older generation listens to the radio because they may not be as comfortable with these different multiple outlet streams to to hear music, and and, and it's convenient right now to be able to just to turn on your radio? Because like I said, most households don't even have a radio anymore, like 10, 20 years ago, where everyone still had literally a radio in their house. You know, it might have been integrated radio cassette player, uh, record player on top or something, but nowadays you go to people's homes and they're streaming off of their phone. And, and so, again, that's just another impact that technology has. And, and, and again, I'm not going to be the judge and say it's good or bad, but it has impacted how the industry is today. And with the slow deterioration of the radio, there was even a faster deterioration of record companies. You don't need to try to go to a record label the same way you you needed to. It, you, record labels still exist, but they're more of a convenience. 20 years ago, it was the only way. There was no other way that you was gonna get to the radio stations, no other way you was gonna get to the mass without the distribution of a record label. Once again, people have shown that you can bypass both record labels and the radio to get their music out to the public. And people know that they don't need to go through a record company or depend on a radio station to hear some of their favorite music. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I think it's kind of unfortunate, but you know, hopefully, um, just like technology has helped me not to have to bear record crates filled with heavy records and, and taking up the majority of the space in my car or whatever I'm using to go from one event to another, hopefully we'll come up with a solution that will, that will preserve uh, radio or at least its likeness and will allow another avenue for people. And I think really probably what's gonna happen if I just was to guess Radio goes away, but it's still broadcast online. So you still have the radio stations. It's just that people are using their cell phone, and it's not in cars or 
not, you know, because people still listen to the radio on their cars. Like, for example, I have people in California and they just they pull up the radio station on their phone and then they Bluetooth it to their car. So they're still listening theoretically to the radio in their car, but it's not a radio station that they dialed into. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think, I think radio is going to probably go more that way versus being extinct. It'll just, it'll just change its, its face. Yeah. So, like, what do you see radio as now, like, as far as, like, it being... Because it's going to transition eventually. So, like, what is it now? It's just... I don't... I, don't <clears throat> I mean, it's not radio then no more. It's just... It's still radio, but the same can be said about newspapers. Okay. You know, newspapers still exist, but every house ain't getting the Sunday paper dropped off at their doorstep like it was 20 years ago, you know? Yeah. So the newspaper still serves its purpose. Uh, I was at a hotel recently, and... I was reminded that the newspaper isn't as vital of an entity as it used to be because every, every Sunday, they would slide the USA Today newspaper underneath my hotel door. And when I recently was in the hotel and that didn't happen, it, it just really kind of brought me back that, wow, we, we, we have, we, we have um, transformed, you know, from those analog uh, devices like the newspaper, and I and I believe that the radio is analog now, you know, it, it, it's but but again, people have understood to segue that analog radio station into simulcasting on their website. So what what makes you think it's um, what makes it so popular still then? Uh, old heads like me that aren't comfortable with the different uh, various. Um, music streams like the Pandora's and all that, you know, the Apple Play and, and, and Spotify's and all that, you know, it's really convenient um, just to turn on the radio because that's a, 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 a entity that's been in our lives since we were born. Wow, that's amazing. Where again, the younger generation, that radio wasn't so influential. Here's another thing, the TV. Local TV stations, right? Not too many people literally watch local TV stations because now they got Hulu and, and all these other type of platforms that they can watch what they want. Movie theaters, another thing. You know, a lot of people, especially since the pandemic, they're like, well, why do I go to a movie theater when I can watch the brand new whatever movie on Amazon, whatever, whatever, or you know, whatever streaming platform they got to watch. You know, so I, I just think that, and especially now they can watch it on their phone, wherever they are, whenever they want. It's right there on their tablet. I think all these analog things like the radio, the TV, newspaper, they're all, um, they're all going to change. They're not going to go away in, in its entirety, but they're going to change. They're going to have to adapt to the way that our world is, is incorporating technology and how it affects those, those entities. Wow. It's, it's, it's crazy how much everything is changing right now. But it's fun. I, I love it. I love technology. You just got to adapt and learn to grow with it. You know? and, and I'll tell you what. I am not... I, I wish I had more of a flexibility in my mindset as far as moving with technology. Um, you know, like I said, I, I DJ with my turntables. They're very heavy. They're very large. They're very time-consuming to set up and to break down. Um, I've passed up opportunities recently to DJ at clubs and so forth because they have these controllers, you know, that are, that are um, plug, set up, unplug, and yet, and the DJs are out. You know, they take their laptop, they control it, and they're out. 
while I'm still trying to unpack the turntables, hook it up to the mixer, unpack the mixer. And I've, a- I've been asked, well, why don't you just get a controller? And I, I could, but I feel like that's so out of my element to not feel the resistance and things, you know, that a turntable can only give you. And, and these controllers just look like little discs that, to the way I look at it, again, I'm not knocking any DJs out there, and I know Kid Capri and all those old school DJs, I have seen y'all on the new stuff, and I got it. But I, I, just, I just can't, I just can't, um, I can't break myself down to learn something new, because you do have to learn that. I mean, DJing is still DJing, but... but transforming what's in my head to what the crowd listens to by way of a different device is a learning curve. And I don't know if I'm, I probably should have did it when we were all shut in two years ago. <laughs> you still got time. I know. I mean, but, uh. I mean, even if you got, you know, somebody that can like, you know, help you out with this, it's, it's like, it's always good to have like a team around, you know, to do things you like you can't do or help you out. Oh, with absolutely. Things. You know, big ups to YouTube university. You yeah, know? of course. YouTube, you can learn <laughs> yeah, a lot on YouTube. Everything. Yeah. But I don't know. Again, it's just, you know, there, there, are, there are certain core values that all of us have, whether it's, man, I could never drive an automatic. You know, I remember yeah, when that was the I thing. See what you're saying, Everybody man. wanted the sticks. Now it's hard to find a car with a stick shift. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I could never drive a car that got four doors, you know, and, and now you got some of these supercars that got four doors. So I'm sure eventually I will move and, and, and expose myself to, to a new learning experience, but it's just one of those things that I'm not eagerly looking forward to. <laughs> I understand. We're going to hope that you do because, like, it's so much, like, things, it's, it just makes everything so much easier, like. I know. In the creative process, it just flows like when you have technology like at your disposal. You know, I'll tell you why I stopped making beats, too, because I was a, a pretty active producer back in the day. Um, I still have my library under ASCAP. And one thing that um, about the creative process that you, that you mentioned, um, to have... A, 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 a 64 key keyboard and to have a drum machine um, and to manipulate those things and I only used a computer to record with not not to make the music but just to record because I'm doing everything analog to me was part of my creative process when Fruity Loops and some of these other software started to saturate the market to where it, it, it eliminated these things because all of the sounds was, was, was modulated from within the, the software. And now I got people just pressing on their mouse, click, 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 click. And they're making bangers now, don't get me wrong. But I was like, dang, that to me, took away from my creative process and, and, and I kind of felt like um, I kind of felt, it's almost like if I'm, a, if I'm a baker, if I'm a world-class baker and I'm used to cracking the eggs and getting the flour and pouring the milk and putting the sugar and whipping it up and now all of a sudden you tell me all I got to do is pour this powder in a bowl and it just add water, <laughs> you know, that, that world-class shelf might not feel yeah. so connected to that yeah. process. So Yeah, you broke it down right there. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like how I felt, you know, about producing. Um, and, and, and luckily DJing never, that, that feeling never um, took away my passion. Uh, for 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 the art of DJ because it is an art just like MCing is an art, uh, graffitiing is an art. Every b-boying 
is an art. Everything, every subcomponent that the culture uh, of hip hop is, it takes, it's an art, and you have to be a student of whatever it is, the, the niche that you're doing and your contributions to hip hop. And so as a DJ, uh, I guess probably why I still got those turntables, I'm still, I'm still gonna affiliate myself with the old school hip hop uh, and the old school classics uh, of music and general, R&B, whatever, disco. Uh, and I'm gonna stay there because um, I kind of feel like I have a mission along with all of the different people that are online. Shout out to all the people who, who concentrate on throwbacks because we are on the same team, the same army, to try to keep that music alive and relevant. Um, and, and, you know, there are some uh, up-and-coming artists that do uh, recognize that and they, they pay homage. Um, um, but but I, I, I tell you, uh, we have to do, as, as, as a hip-hop community, we have to do better in bridging that gap between the legacy hip-hop and the modern hip-hop. You know, I, I hate saying old school, new school. I, I like to say legacy and modern. Um, but, you know, we, we got to figure out how, how to do that because it hasn't been done to date. You, you haven't seen... Um, Let's say Blueface with Jay Z or 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 uh, what was it NBA Young or Young, young boy. NBA Young Boy collabing with Eminem or you know like we we just haven't we haven't been able to 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 cross yes. over like yeah. that um, and and I wonder why I wonder why if you and I can talk about it. Uh, in this studio, on this platform, then I'm sure we're not the only ones. So the, the riddle or, or the question would be why? Why hasn't it been done? It's got to be a logical answer to that. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question right there. I, th I think about that a lot, and I, and I um, think about all the music that's coming out now compared to like the, like the golden age of everything that led up to this point which changed a lot. Like, it's, it's a lot that's, like, not communicated right there. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, that's kind of why I asked you about the radio and the youth. Like, because, I don't know, I feel like, um, I don't know, it's just like a disconnect. And it's like something that needs to be connected. Like, but, I mean, that's something we got to figure out. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I... The cure for cancer might come before for that one because, and I'll tell you something else too. Not only is it just general, general, generationally a gap, but then now you have region as well because people still are biased towards the sound of a particular region. You know, New Yorkers are still going to say, even even with modern rap, that. New York sound is the sound, is, is the face of what hip hop is. And then you're gonna have people in Cali that are gonna say the same thing. And I think we would probably see regionally a more of a collaboration between the legacy and the modern artists before we see something that stretches between regions, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like, since we're in South Florida, I'll use this as an example. I could see, like, you know, you got Luke, all right? Luke, very influential, hip-hop pioneer for this region. I could, I could easily see him hooking up with, with one of the youngsters out this way, like YSFG, you know, BJ. I could clearly see a young artist like that catching the attention of Luke and they collaborate because it's all South Florida. And South Florida has its own distinctive sound. It has its own uniqueness. It, it, it has its own face of what hip hop is. So whether you're in Texas or wherever, so maybe we'll see that before we see um, 
like I said, the crossover between regions and then the generation gap between the legacy rapper collabing with a modern rapper. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. It's, it's a lot of work we got to do. Like, I feel like um, what I'm doing it helps a lot. And, and what you're doing helps a lot with um, just keeping everything alive and just helping people understand the path of everything that happened, you know? Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I want to keep it going. And I want to build off of everything that I've been doing, that I've learned, and all the OGs that taught me everything. I want to build off of everything and just make it bigger and, and help like the younger people understand that all right you can do this and it helps you it helps you with everything all aspects of life and being creative yeah yeah absolutely and and here's the funny thing about about life you know um as a father of four kids and my oldest is 32 years old um my youngest is 14 numerically speaking my youngest son could technically be my grandson, you know, doing the math. I'm 51. So I said that to say, even in your own journey, I think you're further along than, than, than I was in your current path. And just like how, and I, Truly appreciate you recognizing the OGs and, and you give me, you know, my flowers. You, within a matter of a, a snap of a finger, you're going to be the OG. You know, you're going to be that one to um, cultivate the, the modern, uh, not only artists, but the listener. You know what I'm saying? It goes hand in hand, and you're going to sit back, and you're going to be like, dang, you know, um, your responsibility of paying it back to the culture, you're going to be in awe because I could not have seen myself being at this point in my, in my, in my entertainment career, seeing the differences of our culture and trying to educate and and inspire like I was just trying to inspire myself <laughs> you know so and and I just think that with everything that you're doing and and one positive thing about social media is you know in my draws at two o'clock in the morning I could talk to people you know I could talk to other celebrities or fans and just people who support hip-hop and we can exchange thoughts, and we can exchange ideas, uh, something that we could have never done uh, in the 80s, something we could have never done in the 90s. You know, so I do, I do, give, hip, I do give technology its flowers because we are able now to um, cultivate the hip-hop culture to its fullest and everything is transparent. You know, without that technology, you had to go through so many different things to, to get to an objective. Um, whether, again, you was the listener trying to hear your favorite artist, or you was that favorite artist trying to get your music to the listener. You know, and even movies are doing it now. People are doing inter, uh, independent movies without having to get the big budget of Universal or all these other major, you know, and, and, and they have Sundance and all these other outlets that are designed for the independent uh, movie f or filmmaker. You know what I'm saying? So technology, again, is the hub of, of where all of this is going. And, and again, you know, it's platforms like this and it's viewers that subscribe to your message that is going to definitely help the culture advance. And, and I'm really, um, 
I'm really very eager to see not only where my journey leads, because I ain't stopping. I told my wife, when, if I die tomorrow, put them turntables in that casket, girl. They're going with me. <laughs> They're going with me. I see you, Pac. I see all of y'all, Biggie. We're gonna, you're going to have another DJ up there. Right? And so um, I'm not stopping. You know, eh, 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 a little puffy. I ain't going to stop. I ain't going to quit. And, um, you know, again, much props to, to what you're doing, man, and your platform. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Like, I really do. Um, all right, well, shit, let's start with the Q&A. You ready? All right, let's do it. All right. Um, y'all, y'all fellas got questions? Hold on. Um, I'm going to pass you the mic. What's going on? Uh, What's up? What would it take for a new artist to start getting plays on the radio and stuff like that? Um, that's a little complicated. Only for the simple fact that my involvement with the radio doesn't include new artists. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can tell you is this. Through social media, you can contact any radio station, and you can ask that exact question to them. You direct the question to the program director, and they'll be able to tell you. But like I said in the, earlier in this interview, a lot of artists are bypassing the radio. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, and they're not dependent on, on that airplay anymore um, for the simple fact that today's uh, generation of, of of artists have have discovered thanks to Chance the Rapper that that you can you can build up a um, a strong uh, internet presence through all of the different multimedia streams out there and you can give snippets of your music and then tell them go to Spotify click this link blah 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 you know mm -hmm. um, but I do say that there there is still room uh, but you just need to know how to how to go about um, doing that and here's another thing too um all these djs like myself that you find online that have a, a good platform as far as followers you can hit them up and go hey look can i send you something mm -hmm. and what we do as djs even though professionally on the radio i deal with old school established songs like like i can't even take a tupac song that no one's heard and play it because basically it's it, 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 it's underground, mm -hmm. right? My platform is for the mainstream classics, right? That people automatically, like you shouldn't have to Shazam because you never heard it before. You would Shazam because you forgot who it was, right? For sure. So as a new artist, you know, reach out to those DJs and within our DJ network, you send me something, I might not can personally do it, but I have a network of other DJs and, and contacts that I could, I could send that out, I could blast that out to and go, yo, y'all check this out. And, you know, maybe I can't do something with it, but maybe y'all can. Definitely cool. Can I, I got one more question. Sure. What was your uh, best memory in the Coliseum over in Oakland? Man, it was um, 2016. Oh, that was that 12 and 2 year, right? That was when Beast Mode came back. Yep. And Beast Mode, uh, uh, Marshawn Lynch was um, caught on the Megatron, whipping his hair and doing the Bay Area hyphy stuff. Oh yeah, when he was dancing. Yeah, yes. I remember that game. Yeah. Yes. That's what's up. And and I definitely was there. And that that atmosphere was so electrifying. And of course, we won that game. Mm -hmm. And and that that has to be the all time all time all-time favorite memory of being even close as a fan, let alone an employee no, yeah, uh, of the right. Raiders. No, that's, for, that's, that's what's up. Yeah, I always go to the games whenever in town. Yeah, I'll be you know there. I'm, I'm coming for the preseason game. I'll be there. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah, I, I thought they was playing Jacksonville in Jacksonville, but they playing them in Ohio. Yeah. So I ain't going to be able to go to that one. Yeah, it's the no, Hall yeah. of Fame, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but no, it's going to be live. But no, I appreciate it. Yeah, we can ride down there together. <laughs> All right. Um, just to kind of go back to where um, y'all, you guys was having a discussion about um, legacy in the modern music, old school um, and new school. 
um, don't know if you know her, but um, Lotto, Malato, the rapper, um, she had did a sample off of Mariah Carey's song um, called Big Energy. Um, so my question is, do you feel it's a gender situation? Because with her doing that song, she kind of collabed with Mariah Carey for a remix of her song that she sampled. So do you feel it's a, it's a gender situation or just um, just a general situation? Because I know that Mariah Carey, she's an R&B singer, and um, Mulatto, she's a hip-hop, I mean, she's a hip-hop, she's in the hip-hop category. So how do you feel about that? Uh, I think you lost me a little bit with your question. Could you, could you rephrase that? So basically what I'm trying to ask is, like, do you feel it's a gender situation? Like, you know, man... How like you know old school man with the new school uh, rappers, like oh okay yeah. okay, sure or, sure or I can you... yeah 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 I think I I think I got it sure there's a there's a certain marketability um with songs matter of fact uh uh young ma hooked up with um. She hooked up with another female singer. Uh, I forgot what, it was, but but she was a she's a she's an old school singer, and that song was was bomb, and and I think yeah, uh, there 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 can be some correlation between the genders because it's almost like paying homage, you know. I, I wouldn't necessarily expect, um, but 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 they've done it. But I wouldn't necessarily expect, let's say. August Alsina to put out a song and have Queen Latifah rapping on it. I would probably see like August Alsina with Rakim or 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 Big Daddy Kane, you know. So so I could I could see where you're going with that. But now <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't bring up since we talking about genders. You know, there's there's transgenders out there, man, that are that are out there representing. Yeah. You know, so. Um, ain't no telling what the the landscape of that gender correlation uh, or partnership is going to look like here shortly. Um, I know several people in the industry right now that are transgender, and 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 believe it or not, there's a market for that. Okay. And and, and hey, hip hop don't care as long as you got talent, as long as you got flows. You know, that's the yeah. culture. You yeah, can be okay, white, okay. black, male, female, whatever. All right. <laughs> it's about the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's really it. That's uh, my question that I have. That's a great question. Okay. Awesome. Well, I think this is it. We're going to wrap it up. Once again, thank you so much, DJ Newmark, for coming through to the studio talk. And um, you got anything else you want to say? Any shout outs? Yeah, you know, you know y'all can catch me on, on my Instagram. I'm on all social media platforms, but to be honest, I haven't been very proactive on that. You know, there was a time when I would put out content and see what platform gave me the most response between, you know, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all that. And Instagram, uh, hands down, was the number one platform that I got response with. So I stayed and I concentrate on my Instagram. So DJ Newmark uh, on Instagram, DJ N-E-W-M-A-R-K. Or you can even go to DJNewmark.com to find out where I'm performing, find out my, uh, my radio shows. You can even go to the radio station um, uh, website at YoPalmBeach.com. Y-O, palmbeach.com. Once you get there, click the Listen Live link, and no matter where you're at in the world, as long as you got internet connection, you can listen live to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and especially catch the DJ Newmark experience every Saturday, every Sunday from 3 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the Flavor on Top of Flavor Master Mix coming at 6 to 7 p.m. I'm telling you, you won't be disappointed for sure. Fire. I got uh, one more thing. Um, is there anything you want to say to um, the youth, like being like a like an artist or a DJ out there that's trying to do their thing, follow their dream? Yeah, you know, again, it's your vision. 
whatever your vision is, be passionate. Uh, think about it, though. Think about the roadmap from A to Z. I would also encourage you to uh, do your history as well. Uh, it's said that a person won't know where they're going unless they know where they've been. All right, so the culture demands and deserves that kind of respect. And you know, I, I know everybody wants to put their own spin on the game, which I certainly encourage you to do that. But, but please, the culture requires you to make sure you know uh, about the legacy journeys um, that, that help propel the culture to what it is to now and the opportunities that's presented now. No different than our communities. You know, we, we enjoy certain liberties and certain advancements within our communities. Uh, let's not forget those people who made sacrifices uh, for us to get to what we're enjoying today. And that's it. I appreciate you inviting me. Uh, this has been a blast. And uh, I'm definitely going to be a, a dedicated subscriber to the channel. And you're doing big things. And again, on behalf of the culture, I want to give you your flowers and say thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I'm also giving you your flowers. Um, you are truly a pioneer, an uh, innovator, somebody that's out here really putting on for the culture. And um, yeah, thank you again. And um, I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Shout out DJ Newmark and everybody that came for the Q&A. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for the next studio talk. We out.